And we're live. Welcome back, everybody, to a new episode of the Wheelie Podcast. I'm your host, Micah Toll, and I'm joined again by Electric Seth Weintraub. How's it going, Seth? I'm good. Awesome. And we've got a very diverse selection of e-bike stories to cover this week. Uh, some interesting news from new electric bike unveilings from Go Cycles, some uh, sadder news about a big electric bike heist that we're going to cover. Um, we've got uh, an interesting story about the history of how car companies keep screwing up e-bikes and they've been doing it for decades, believe it or not. Uh, some more sort of uh, unfortunate news out of Taiwan uh, with the earthquake and an interesting story about how electric scooters actually rushed into the rescue. Uh, Harley's got a new electric motorcycle and then we're going to finish it off with a review of some protective gear that might just make e-bike rides a bit safer. So where are we going to start off this week, Seth? All right, let's start with GoCycle. Uh, GoCycle unveils new images of its premium lightweight belt drive cargo electric bike. This one is quite interesting to me because GoCycle has always been sort of a um, small format folding e-bike brand. You know, they, they build very high end, very premium bikes, but they're certainly not cargo bikes. You know, they're designed to be um, sort of minimalist in size, certainly not in features, but to fit into an urban commuter's life. And so they've taken that same kind of uh, design ethos with like, you know, exotic materials, lightweight design, and now they've translated it into a cargo bike design. Um, and it's important to note here that there's there's a lot of uh, what they refer to as like racing lineage um, designed into this. Uh, part of the reason is that the designer and the founder of GoCycle comes from McLaren and he's, you know, has a background in F1. And, and you can see a lot of that sort of inspiration here. So, you know, we've got all sorts of interesting components, uh, magnesium, carbon fiber, uh, really interesting sort of swoopy designs, these little like winglets like you'd see on F1 cars. So really cool designs, but uh, probably more important are the features. For a cargo bike, you know, it has to be, um, you know, support uh, heavy loads. This one has, I think, 440 pounds of uh, load capacity. So, you know, you can get an adult rider and a couple of kids, you know, a couple of good sized kids back there, not just babies kind of thing. Um, the bike itself is just like really slickly designed with a couple of different handlebar options. There are these like paddle shifters. So if you want to shift yourself, you can use those paddle shifters. Uh, if you prefer, there's electronic shifting, which um, you know has always been a, a feature on these high-end go cycle bikes, uh, because at these price points, you know they, they really have to throw a lot of features at you to make it worth it. Uh, speaking of which, this is definitely not a a cheap bike. You know, when you say things like carbon fiber, those kinds of things, you know, you're not going to get off uh, easy. And so there's two different models here. Um, the lower one starts at I believe it's uh, sixty. It's either sixty four ninety nine or sixty nine ninety nine. So you know, pretty pretty expensive. And then they go up from there. The good news is you can get your foot in the door with just a, a five hundred dollar deposit to uh, to hold that one for you. But this is definitely one of the the pricier cargo e bikes I've ever seen. Um, probably not the priciest. I think you know, recent Moller or maybe even Urban Arrow have some some pricier models. Though they usually have you know like. Um, uh, the big like front, uh, what do you call that thing? Uh, like the boat in the front, the uh, the bathtub looking thing that the kids can sit in. So a little more complicated. But on this side, you know, we've just gone with a, a much different direction. Something like uh, 50 pounds, I believe, which is crazy for a, you know, a cargo bike. Just super wow. lightweight, super slick looking, single sided wheels. Um, anything that can be is like not aluminum at some exotic material that's even lighter. So, you know, really cool to just see from an engineering perspective, what can be designed into uh, an electric cargo bike. You know, the, in my opinion, it really does take that sort of uh, F1 design ethos that like spare no expense, just make it like as light as possible. So it's cool to see that here. Uh, I just hope that there are enough people out there that can afford something like this. Yeah, I think this is probably more of a European bike than uh, something that you'd see often in the US, although it sounds like they're going to be here with the uh, U.S. Price, U.S. dollar pricing. Uh, on that note, the five hundred dollar deposit is five times as much as um, I put down on a Rivian R two. So, <laughs> so that's that's uh, perspective. You should do pound um, for pound, also. <laughs> right. Um, so 
I, this bike looks amazing. It looks really cool. Um, obviously, there's some, you know, like, hey, why did they do that? Is that is that a front and rear motor, or is that um, just like what's going on in on this thing here? No, it's um, I believe only a. I think Those it's like, just a front motor, actually. Yeah. Okay. So the rear is uh, where the transmission is. It's a automatic shifting internal hub. So I okay. think it's just front motor. Okay, and then the uh, the handlebars that you mentioned uh, with the paddle shifters, those I don't think I've seen before anything like them before, except you know in the down tube kind of situation. Um, what do you think about that? Is that gonna is that gonna be a plus or a minus or polarizing? Yeah, it? it's. I mean, I definitely think it'll be polarizing. Um, without having tried it myself, it, it's hard to say. It, I mean, it looks really cool, and I could see it working, but your hands are in a very different position than like mine are used to being. I'm very much like a, a flat bar kind of guy, which you certainly can hold these bars that way, but it seems like the, the paddle shifters work better when you're on the, the bar ends, but they do offer a sort of normal handlebar option. I think this might even be the, the higher priced version here. So if you don't want these kind of funky, uh, unique handlebars, you can go, regular but these kind of look interesting like i'm certainly curious to try i just don't know you know how much I'll, I'll like this after having spent my entire life on basically straight bars yeah i mean it's it kind of takes like the dutch bars to an, ex an extreme um <laughs> it also reminds me like uh you know we were mentioning uh down tube um if you're like standing up you could you kind of have a higher seat position and and your uh your hands are naturally like longitudinal so maybe that makes sense if you're standing up and then normally you would just ride on the on this the, this horizontal thing i don't know uh altogether it seems pretty interesting like uh you know this this isn't just a render obviously go cycle makes tons of bikes um when are these going to be in people's hands i believe they they're saying september so it's a little ways off uh it's been kind of a tumultuous past year or so so hopefully you know those uh, time frames stick to it, but uh, if all goes according to plan, then by the end of about quarter three, hopefully we'll see these things out on the streets. Oh, and one last thing: um, this is a very long uh, belt. Uh, is that is that something new, or or is it just gates? Um, yeah, I'm not even sure if that's a belt or a chain. It might be a belt, but they have a entirely enclosed. Um, I Let's guess like belt in this one. Oh, I do see the belt there. Yeah, so that is a belt drive, which is interesting because they did use chain um, on many of those clean drives. That's what they call that piece um, on their folding bikes because it's entirely encapsulated on the other models. Mm -hmm. And so e even with the chain, like you never get you know grease or oil. But it looks like that one is open on the top, so they probably went with the belt. And these, you, you call these like a winglets, or is this for like people to put their feet at times, or is this just a, a design thing? Yeah, I was wondering that myself. I, I'm kind of wondering if the kid that's sitting like in the front position can use that to put their feet on. Um, because or, you know, or maybe if you're just riding around and you see a friend and you don't have any kind of seat or anything, they can just hop on it on the back. It's like the, the super high end version of pegs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, they gotta be functional because Go Cycle doesn't, you know, just do things without a reason. Like if there's right. something on there, it's it's because it serves a purpose. Yeah, and that kickstand is ultra wide there, so good loading capacity there. Yeah, like they, they build good bikes. They're expensive, but they know what they're doing. All right, here's an interesting one. Uh, how professional thieves stole $1 million worth of unreleased e-bikes in seven minutes. Yeah, this one's a real gut punch. I can only imagine how the, the company who who built these bikes, bike tricks, uh, felt after this. So a couple of weeks ago, um, they had an entire container of unreleased e-bikes stolen out of their, uh, warehouse, uh, parking grounds. So it's their, uh, juggernaut FSST, a new model, um, that these were the first ones into the country to be distributed to, um, pre-order holders. And the, um, the suspected thieves, they caught them on video coming by to like case the joint, I think a couple days before. Um, then they came back at like one in the morning. I think it was on like a, uh, a Saturday night or something, you know, when there wouldn't have been a lot of activity at one of these, you know, warehouses. And they came with a rented, uh, semi truck 
and just broke into the lot, pulled up to the container, which was already on a chassis. That's basically like the wheels that go under a shipping container. Um, it was locked, but I guess they just broke whatever lock was on the chassis, hooked it up to their semi truck and just drove off with um, what uh, bike trick says is about a million dollars worth of uh, retail value e-bikes, which is just like such a, a, a gut punch. But to make it worse, uh, when they went to the police, which they're located in Canada, the police were really hamstrung because um, the the bike tricks team learned that even like the local uh, traffic cameras, like at all the intersections, they don't actually record anything unless a uh, someone's speeding or you know someone runs through a red light. Like they're not always recording, so they weren't even able to get video of where the thieves went. Um, they did have an image of the uh, license plate, and so the police were able to basically put a tail on. I guess the suspected thieves, whoever the the plate was registered to, but in Canada, they can only tail them for two days. And if they don't go, you know, anywhere near the, the stolen bikes and basically lead the cops to the bikes in two days, then they have to like call off the, the surveillance. So basically the thieves just essentially got away and, you know, they're, they're hoping that, um, you know, the police will find these or that, um, insurance will cover them. Unfortunately, they had insurance, like it's called ship to shore, but at this point they were already on shore and at the warehouse. So it's this unfortunate sort of gray area between insurance coverage. So it's, un, it appears unlikely that these are going to be covered by, by the company's insurance. Um, but the, I mean, the only sort of saving grace here is that because there are no other bikes out there like this, if anyone has one, it's a hundred percent a stolen e-bike. So if these do sort of pop up on the secondhand market, uh, bike tricks, and I mean, anyone will be able to tell like this is this is a stolen e-bike. Uh, they did release the uh, serial numbers of all these bikes so you can check. But if you have one, like it, it was stolen. That, that's the only option. Yeah, I guess that's good uh, that, that, you know, there, there's not any like real ones out there. Um, it, it is interesting, like, if I'm thinking about this, it seems like an inside job, like not necessarily a bike tricks uh, employee, but like somebody at the warehouse or somebody, it seems like, you know, they kind of calculated all the the ways to get, get a hold of these things and not really get caught. Um, yeah. It, I mean, it definitely could be. And by looking at the video there, it doesn't look like it's, you know, bike tricks own, um, you know, like a warehouse that they own. It looks like it's, sort of a, a container yard, which these are often, you know, sort of contracted out for companies that, that bring in containers. Like my container, when I got one, went to a, a, a container yard like this. So it's, it's quite possible, like you're saying, that, you know, there was an employee just of this uh, warehouse facility that knew like, hey, that one's full of $6,000 e-bikes or whatever. Right. Yeah. So is the company, uh, like, is this going to bankrupt the company or are they going to figure out what to do or what, what's the story there? I don't know. They, they did release a blog post about this and it sounded, um, you know, pretty, pretty dark. I don't know that it's, you know, this is going to bankrupt them, but, um, you know, if these were, if this was a million dollars worth of bikes retail, then, you know, it was probably at least a half million or so just in, in outlay from them right. to get the bikes produced and then shipped and, and everything else. Yeah. That's a shame. Well, uh, I guess keep keep an eye on Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist for uh, these bikes. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's talk about car companies, uh, and we don't like them. Car companies have been screwing up e-bikes for longer than you think. <laughs> yeah, so I, I was uh, on LinkedIn the other day reading articles, and I found one found by uh, written by Ed Benjamin, who he's well-known in the sort of like e-bike uh, trade industry. He's, he's worked in the e-bike industry for probably a couple decades now. Um, and like longer than me. And I think I've been a decade and a half. So I feel like a dinosaur. <laughs> he's represented a lot of bike companies. Uh, and he's also consulted for car companies that have tried to build e-bikes. And he wrote an interesting article about some of the failures. And so uh, I looked into it and then I went back through a lot of my stories and it was like, wow, I've covered like a lot of car companies that have, have tried and failed. So I took a bit of a deep dive here into sort of the history of it. And yeah, I mean, for, for nearly three decades now, car companies have just fumbled e-bikes over and over. Like uh, it 
it didn't start with Lee Iacocca, but he was one of the first back in the early nineties to say like, you know, we should be doing electric bikes. These are going to be something. And, um, the, the e-bike actually at the top of the article there is his e-bike. Um, it's funny cause they had to like write, uh, e-bike across the side of it, uh, down one more. That's the Jeep one. Oh. Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, that one. Um, and so that's Lee Iacocca's like original, I think it was like 1995 or 1997, uh, e-bike. Uh, the problem is like, they just couldn't sell them. Like they tried to have them in Ford dealerships and, uh, salespeople didn't want to sell them because you make a lot more commission on a Ford Taurus than on a thousand dollar e-bike. And then the dealerships didn't want to have to deal with servicing these things because you make a lot more money in a car bay, you know, changing brakes and, you know, oil and everything than changing brake pads on a bike. So, um, each time, you know, the, these things kept coming out, you know, they'd be interestingly designed. I mean, for 1995 or so, that looks like a nice e-bike. Um, but the salespeople just like couldn't get it across the finish line here and they, they couldn't sell these things. And then that kept repeating. One of the only places that um, car and like car system makers could sell e-bikes was in Japan, where it was kind of like a different mindset. But even then, um, you know, Yamaha was, was early in the, the e-bike space. Uh, and they were only able to do it in Japan. They couldn't really sell them outside for for many years, um, which brings up motorcycle companies too. Like motorcycle companies have tried and failed. Uh, Harley Davidson had one of the best efforts recently with Serial One. Um, you know, they sold probably hundreds. I don't know if they got to thousands of bikes, but uh, eventually the brand sort of died off. It was sold to some bike company, and uh, now it's trying to be revived because you know the brand itself still has value and that's just i mean that's happened over and over again um the uh let's see who who else was in there i mean we've had e-bikes from gm um gms was was interesting because they actually developed it in-house and it was really a, a nice looking bike but that uh, ultimately uh, failed to make it to the market um bmw has tried skoda um polestar <laughs> Uh, even, uh, Rivian is apparently working on e-bike designs. Um, and you know, we'll see if, if maybe they can be one of the first ones to actually do it right and, and sell these things. They have brought in several, uh, bike industry experts. I think they poached a few people from specialized and, you know, yep. so they have real, real bike people on their team. So, uh, you know, they might stand a better chance, but if, if you sort of trace back through the history, every car company that has tried you know, Jeep, uh, all these other companies have failed to, to find any real uh, sales. And, and a lot of them have had pretty, uh, you know, well-known failures like GM here, which is unfortunate because you'd think if anyone had the manufacturing might to make this happen, it would be car companies. Maybe Tesla can do it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, Elon Musk has said on record that he would not make a motorcycle, but he would make an e-bike. So that would be a nice thing um as far as rivian's concerned um they just recently laid off i think 10 percent of their workforce so we went in after that to make sure that all the bike people were still employed by rivian and as far as we can tell that's the case so the, that thing is still going on uh, inside rivian um it, you know you're right uh, we've seen you know e-bikes show up at car companies and it kind of it, it brings up the question and like well why can't why isn't there an e-bike company that kind of consolidates a lot of the industry? Like it, it seems like no e-bike company can get past a certain like market share. And, and, you know, that market share is really low, like maybe 5% or something. Um, so like it, it begs the question, like what, why can't, why can't there be a, you know, a, a 20, 30% of the market e-bike company? Why, why do these, like little companies keep coming up and eating all the lunch of the bigger companies. It doesn't really make sense. What do you think about that? Well, I think that if you compare the, the e-bike industry to sort of like the automobile industry, I think that we're around like the 1920s or so back mm -hmm. when, you know, there were like a hundred different companies, like any had like a check from his dad and a machine shop could start a, a car company back then. Right. And so, it's, it's kind of similar. Now, anyone who can get a little bit of investment funding can go to China and start an e-bike brand. And even among like the good brands, you know, the, there's probably 
at least a dozen or more brands that I would say like these are solid, like not out of a catalog e-bike brands. And that's just in the US. So I, I think we're still in the early days when there's so much opportunity and we haven't sort of weeded out the all of the extra companies, you know, all the car companies that we don't even hear about anymore because they died in the 30s right. kind of thing. Um, and if anything, we're kind of starting to see that weeding out. There are a lot of companies say, failing. Yeah. yeah, we might be at that point right now. Um, we're only the strong are going to survive through the next couple of years. But it does seem like, it, you know, still every day, like we get a new pitch from a company from out of China that we've never heard of with, you know, similar looking e-bikes, nothing too revolutionary. Uh, maybe, you know, one or two things have changed. But um, it's just I wonder if maybe the U.S. is in one one stage of the, the e-bike development process and China's in another one where they're, you know, they get a lot. Of, there's a lot of government investment um, and like you said, anybody with a, a, a garage and a, you know, a, a blank check can start a company pretty easily. So, yeah. And that's the thing in China, there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, government money kind of floating into uh, some of these industries. So I think that there's, you know, a, a bit of an unfair advantage compared to American companies. And that's might be artificially increasing the number of those sort of like no name startups we're seeing. Yeah, but um, you know, on the flip side of that is that the, once the consolidation happens in the U.S., um, theoretically, there's going to be a, a, a smaller cadre of you know more healthy, uh, bigger companies that are you know uh, making you know, standardized bikes. Um, speaking of China, um, you are going to China pretty soon here, right? Yes, in a few hours. Okay, well. <laughs> That is soon. Uh, what uh, what what's what's on the agenda for you you while you're there? Um, a, a lot. I'm trying to keep it straight in my head. We're going to be visiting uh, a bunch of companies while we're there, from e-bike companies like Ride One Up to motor companies, Ananda, um, battery companies. I forget which one exactly. Um, motorcycle companies. I think we'll be at Tromox. Um, there's a few others. It's, it's like hard to keep straight in my head. We're going to see a lot of, oh, we're going to a, um, like an electric tricycle factory that makes those like, like a tuk-tuk style uh, oh, nice. trikes. Uh, oh, Yadea, which makes um, a pile of different scooters, motorcycles, uh, bikes, everything. Yeah, a lot. It's like a little over a week. So um, should have a lot of interesting things to share. Awesome. We'll look forward to that uh, in two weeks. Um, speaking of, well, not China, uh, as massive earthquake rocks Taiwan and shutters trains, battery swapping e-scooters, Russian to the rescue. Yeah, this one's unfortunate. I, I think most people have heard the news. Uh, a couple of days ago, there was a 7.4 magnitude earthquake in Taiwan, the biggest they've had in 25 years. It um, shut down subway service in uh, many cities. Um, including Taipei and New Taipei City, which is like the largest metropolitan area. Um, a lot of roads became impassable uh, because, you know, pieces were, were missing. Basically, there are a lot of landslides. Um, in, in many areas, even if the roads were passable, the traffic was just standstill um, and you couldn't get around. And so scooters, which are already the most popular type of vehicle in Taiwan, they outnumber cars two to one, uh, scooters became like the main way to get around more than ever. And what's interesting is Gogoro, which um, is the uh, the largest battery swapping electric scooter company in the world. They're uh, headquartered in Taiwan. Their uh, go stations, the battery swapping network, stayed up throughout uh, the entire uh, earthquake and the aftermath, even when you know the subway shut down and other major forms of transportation shut down. Uh, their GoShare network stayed up, which is uh, where they have their scooters that people can rent by the minute, just like a Lime scooter. But, you know, these are like, um, you know, 30, 40, 50 mile an hour seated scooters. So, you know, a lot more uh, capable than a Lime scooter. And they uh, opened up that GoShare network uh, to offer free rides to uh, everyone in uh, Taipei and New, New Taipei City. Um, which was like the hardest hit from all of the uh, transportation outages. So everyone was uh, available to uh, make use of those battery swapping stations 
and the uh, free electric scooters to be able to get around, you know, find family, uh, get to safety, that sort of thing, which was, um, you know, awesome to have that capacity, but also sort of, you know, taking a step back and, and looking at disaster response in general, the fact that having this widely distributed energy network uh, and a type of vehicle that could navigate even when, you know, pieces of roads were missing, like all you need is like this much road to be able to get through on a scooter. And when traffic is is literally turned, you know, highways into parking lots, scooters can still uh, get through. So it was really interesting to see that kind of uh, capability of, of the GO stations and these electric scooters and the response. Um, and, you know, even in, in times of disaster, uh, gas scooters can have serious problems because if the flow of, of fuel runs out, you know, they're not being refueled, that's it, you know, they're, they're done. But with the GO stations, because it's distributed every 200 meters or so, you know, every like six, 700 feet, there's a battery swapping station and they keep going throughout natural disasters. In fact, they're actually used for um, emergency backup for many systems. About 20% of the traffic lights at, at intersections in Taipei use GoGro batteries for backup. So, you know, in the event of a, a nationwide power outage, the, the traffic lights can keep running. Um, and in fact, a couple of years ago, there was a nationwide um, electrical outage and even gas stations couldn't pump gas, but everyone with a GoGro scooter could still like swap batteries and that system kept running. It, it was kind of amazing to to see it in action like that. Yeah, it's funny, um, you know, on the, on the car side, people are always like, well, what happens when the grid goes down? How, what are you going to do with your electric car then? And I'm like, well, it's it's got a battery. Like that, that's going to last as long as a tank of gas. And by the way, that uh, gas station that you think is going to save you from the electrical outage uh, isn't going to be pumping any gas because those pumps are electric. And you know, unless there's a backup, a battery backup or something, uh, that gas station is going to be just as down as the rest of the grid. So, um, you know batteries are kind of coming to the rescue here. Um, it, it's interesting you mentioned that the uh, the Gogoro st stations or the batteries are the are the backup. Or, like do the actual stations, can they pull electricity from all the batteries they have and put it back into the grid? Or is it kind of just, uh, you know, sneaker net where you, you, they, they actually use the batteries? So it's a combination. Um, many of the stations have been retrofitted to feed back into the grid and they're actually part of the, uh, the nationwide sort of like emergency electrical response. Uh, in fact, when like the, the frequency of the electricity starts to dip, um, which was like the major thing that happened in, in Texas that almost like wiped out their, their electrical grid a couple of winters ago, when it starts to yep. dip, they uh, draw upon GoGro stations to uh, feed power back into the grid to sort of stabilize it uh, when necessary. But the, the intersections actually um, can physically run off of a battery. So like you stick a battery in like a receptacle somewhere and it will power the, the traffic lights for three hours. And so, you know, after three hours, you just like stick another battery in. That's pretty interesting. Uh, traffic lights. I wonder what other applications could use a GoGo -Go battery. You know, they, actually, they actually started using them for um, like smart parking meters. So instead of like having a meter maid walk around, there are these um, parking towers that just like take a picture of a parking lot once a minute. And so they started using GoGo batteries for those in Taiwan as well. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy how many applications, once you realize you have like a lunchbox sized power cell, like how many things can you run with it? Yeah, I mean, maybe GoGo becomes the holy grail of like battery standardization. Uh, you know, theoretically, you could start running lawnmowers off of them and all the all those power tools that we hate that have, you know, each brand has their own standardized battery. It would be nice if uh, a battery standard could come out of all this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they've already got, I think it's like one and a half or 1.8 million batteries or something they've made. I mean, like it's That's kind hard. of the de facto standard. There's yeah. something like uh, 10 or so other uh, motorcycle companies that produce to fit their batteries. Like they've opened it up. So like Yamaha makes a uh, scooter that takes GoGo batteries, uh, a bunch of other companies, same thing. So it, it really is kind of becoming like a, a de facto standard, at least in Asia. What are the specs on that battery? Uh, you know, what voltage is it? 48 volt or? I think it's 12 S, which is like a little bit below 48, like 44 or something. Um, cause normal. Um, yeah. Cause normal 48, like for our e-bikes, they're, they're 13 cells. So I think these are 12, 
Okay. And then it's uh, 35 amp hours. So I think it's like 1.8 kilowatt hours or so. But that would get a couple of acres of lawn mode. So, yeah. So something like maybe like three e bike batteries kind of thing. Yeah, pretty good. All right. Let's move on here. Uh, we spoke about Harley Davidson earlier. Uh, Harley Davidson's Livewire launches first electric cruiser motorcycle, the S2 Mulholland. Yeah, this one is, uh, it's interesting for me because I actually just got the um, sort of like uh, flat tracker version of this bike uh, maybe a month ago or so, um, which was Livewire's second model. This is now the third one, which is produced on the same platform, which is a really uh, interesting way for them to be able to roll out successive motorcycle models without having to, you know, design new frames and new batteries and, you know, new, new everything. Uh, it's not like, you know, a crazy novel idea. Zero also does the same thing. Other companies do as well, use that same platform. But this is a great illustration because unlike my bike, which is the S2 Del Mar, that's more of like a, a flat tracker and on the road feels like a, a kind of a roadster. This is intended to be more of a cruiser. Now it's not like you would imagine stereotypical Harley cruisers, you know, with like the really high bars and the foot pegs that are like practically out on the fork kind of thing, or, you know, foot platform sometimes. Um, so it's a little more of what they call a performance cruiser, but at the same time, it, it seriously it does have that performance. The zero to 60 is I think 3.3 seconds, Jeez. which is yeah, quite fast. Um, now mine is three seconds, so you know a little faster. They they toned it down for the uh, for the S3 compared to the S2, but um, I mean that's still you know super fast. And and anyone who's on a cruiser is not you know trying to set quarter mile times kind of thing. So it's fast enough for anyone. Um, and then they've got a bunch of sort of cruiser style accessories. There you can see the the more comfortable pillion seat for if you've got um, you know like your partner on back or or you're taking a friend with you that it's a little nicer to sit back there. Um, but ultimately this is really a push by Harley, um, or rather Livewire, Harley's, uh, all electric brand to expand their market into, um, you know, younger, more urban riders and try to reach a, uh, a price point that's more, uh, mass market compared to their Livewire one, which is their flagship bike at 23,000. This one's priced at, uh, $16,000. So you know, it's, it's expensive, but it's like normal Harley Davidson expensive, not like crazy expensive. Um, and in fact, compared to, you know, zero, that's slightly more than zero on like a, you know, watt per watt basis or a, you know, kilowatt hour basis, but, um, you know, still certainly within the, the, the realm of normal flagship motorcycles in the electric motorcycle market right now. Um, and here we see, uh, Zach's, uh, test ride, right? Yep. Or I guess it's the um, like stock pictures, but he took this out for a, uh, a test ride. Oh, he actually went to the same dealership to borrow one where I bought mine. That's the oh, really? uh, Alligator yeah. Alley dealership. Florida, yeah. 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 So um, if you guys are thinking about picking one up, make sure you check out uh, Zach's review. Um, that does look like a nice bike. Um, are they so what? Like, are they going to make a ton of these? Or are they going to sell a ton of these? Are they kind of, I mean, the, with the, the price point of a Harley, it feels like it's more of a low volume situation. Yeah. I mean, it was intended to be a high volume situation. Uh, like a year ago, I think they were talking about, you know, like thousands of units, maybe even tens of thousands, but certainly, you know, like high thousands. Mm -hmm. um, this year, they scaled back those projections, which, you know, the whole motorcycle industry is is not doing. Uh, incredibly well. So I think those projections were a bit lofty even at the time a year ago. Um, but, you know, I, I could see them selling certainly the low thousands of these. Personally, I think the uh, the S2 Del Mar is a bit more attractive. This one has slightly longer range. I think it's like 120 miles of, uh, or maybe 130 miles of, of city range compared to, uh, oh, there it is, 121 compared to mine, the S2 Del Mar, which is 110, I think. So somehow with the same battery, they managed to eke out a little bit more, more range. But still, I think the S2 Del Mar just like speaks to people a little bit more. Because um, this one, like they call it a cruiser. It's not like really a traditional cruiser in the way lots of people think of, especially the seating position. So um, hopefully they, they sell well on this one. But I think the S2 Del Mar is still going to be a, a better seller than this model. 
Yeah. Uh, and how's yours holding up? Is it uh, everything you'd hoped? Yeah, I've been traveling so much that I haven't had a chance to put too many miles on it yet. Um, but so far, it's been great. I didn't get a chance to do the um, uh, one of the over the air updates that came out right after I got it, um, which apparently there was something that was draining the 12 volt battery in it. And that was the update to fix it. And uh -huh. Right before I was headed to the airport, I got a notification on the bike that said like, hey, you have an update. And I was like, oh, I'm not going to do it now. I don't have time. Right. If I had, I wouldn't have come back to a, a dead 12-volt battery. So I had to change the 12-volt. Um, it was all under warranty and everything, which which was fine. But then I did the update that would have prevented me from having that problem. Oh, man, so close. All right. Uh, one uh, commenter says that um, that uh, Harley's going to have to get on board with uh, everybody else's Move to the Nax, uh, which is you know, the Tesla adapter, uh, which I think is inevitable as the next standard for uh, car charging. But also, since um, Harley uses that, you know, the car charging standards, uh, the J1772 currently, um, I think they're probably going to end up using that. And obviously, adapters are available. So, yeah, I think they'll have to switch over to that. Which is funny because when I first got the bike. I, I rode it back to uh, my sister's place where I was going to park it and I was pretty low on charge. I knew her neighbor um, had a, uh, a level two charger, but I forgot they were Tesla. So um, I figured I'd be able to borrow the neighbors. I got there and like plug doesn't fit. So I ran into that issue myself. So it would be nice if they uh, adopt that uh, Nax charger at some point. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't necessarily want to give one company all the, all the power, but at the same time, it's a more elegant, uh, solution and it's uh, like it's better to have one solution than two or more if you include uh, what is it the uh, Chatamo uh, that's still hanging around. Um, it's frustrating because I was just at a uh, charger. I'm I'm uh, in Colorado right now. I was just at a charger and uh, this this uh, fast charger had two adapters. One was uh, CCS combo, but that was taken. And uh, the car I'm in is. Uh, Hyundai, or sorry, a Kia EV9. And the other charger was a Chatamo one. I was like, why? So close. Why would, <laughs> why would you uh, build this, you know, this relatively new charger? So I don't know. Yeah. It's like uh, you're an inch away from these metal pins making contact. I know. It's just a bunch of electrons. They want to they go into your car, but they can't. All you right. Last story. Foil on there. Yeah revolutionizing rider safety detective jacket every e-biker should consider. Yeah, so I remember a few years ago, you and I were actually talking about this, I think at Eurobike, and I remember being like, why is it that when I ride my motorcycles, like I gear up, like, you know, I do all the all the protective riding gear, but if I'm doing the same speed on an e-bike, like I'm in a t-shirt and, you know, sandals, just like flying down the road, like why don't I gear up? And so I started looking around um, because I don't want to wear all my motorcycle gear on an e-bike, right? Like even if, you know, I'm doing like 30 miles an hour or more, it just feels weird to, to have all that bulky gear on. And so I found this riding jacket, actually a couple jackets from beyond riders, um, uh, disclaimer, they did send me the jackets. So, um, but my, all my thoughts here are my thoughts. And personally, I just think these things are awesome because they don't look like riding gear. You know, they're not like big bulky uh, jackets, but they're still armored. Uh, the outside is aramid fiber. So, you know, you can like slide across the ground at highway speeds and not lose the skin off of your shoulders and, and elbows and everything. Uh, but then they also hide level two armor under them. So the shoulders, uh, the elbows, uh, the back, and then one of the two jackets also has chest armor as well. So in something that like my wife says that I can wear out on a date, it <laughs> like looks that normal. I can still have all of that protection. So uh, here, like showing some of the the first pictures of how I normally ride, and then here's this jacket that just doesn't look like you know a big bulky motorcycle jacket like my Dan EC you know racing jacket with like the aluminum sliders on the elbows and and stuff like that. Um, so to me, it just it makes so much sense for for e bike riders to consider wearing some of the safety stuff because like when I think about my habits, I mean I've been riding e bikes for a long time. And I just sort of like get into that mindset of like, oh, it's an e-bike. Like, you know, I don't need to, you know, put on protective gear. I have my helmet. I'll be fine. But it doesn't matter if you're on a motorcycle or an e-bike. That car is going to, you know, hit you the same. And what you're wearing is, is going to make the difference. And so if there's gear out there that is 
unobtrusive enough and comfortable enough that you're actually going to wear it each time you go out, then that's what's going to make the difference. Not the like $900 racing jacket I have that I never wear because it's like so like leathery and bulky and, and everything. So to me, this was just like a really cool chance to, to find something that would fit what I was looking for, a, a comfortable uh, protective solution for e-biking that just doesn't get in the way. Yeah. And as a bonus, you look a little bit more jacked with all that padding. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And like, you know, it's good enough for motorcycles. Like it's level two motorcycle armor. Um, yeah. A lot of like, it's not e-bike protective gear. It's like all riders. So there these, this company is apparently really big in like electric skateboarding and electric unicycle in the worlds, but um, also motorcyclists. Like they didn't kind of intend to go the motorcycle route. They just wanted to have like motorcycle level safety, but because it, it looks pretty good. Um, you know, a lot of motorcyclists found them. And so I was talking to the owner and he said like, yeah, a huge portion of our cells are now actually from motorcyclists, like not just all the other riders out there. Um, and they've really expanded too. like, I was looking at their offerings. They have hoodies that like look like a normal hoodie, but they've got all the motorcycle armor in there Interesting. and like pants. And yeah, it's, it's crazy. I gotta get a set of pants next. Cause like, that's the thing that I'm missing. Like I have riding jeans, but with, you know, with armor, but they're kind of like bulky and less comfortable. So they have, you know, like uh, sort of canvas uh, or like khaki cargo pants and stuff that just look like more comfortable, but still have all that armor in them. Yeah. And I'll, I'll give you another uh, use case for these. Uh, my son's uh, competing here in uh, <clears throat> Colorado uh, in the snowboard championships. And a lot of these events are pretty dangerous. Um, and he's wearing a full armor uh, you know, in, in addition to a helmet, um, he, you know, if they wreck hard, um, one of his friends actually ruptured his spleen. Um, oh, so, geez. yeah, so it's, uh, it, it's, it's a nice, another, uh, good, good place to wear uh, full body armor like this. And if you can do it in style, which obviously is a snowboarding, uh, importance, uh, then even better. So. Yeah, definitely. They should check out the hoodies. Like that would be awesome going down the slopes. Exactly. The hoodies make the most sense I've I've heard of. What we're definitely going to take a look at this afterwards. Uh, it's the end of the season now, but uh, we're going to check it out for next year for sure. All right. Um, we have one comment, so we'll go with that real quick. Um, we were talking about the go cycle. Let me see if I can go back here. We were talking about the foot pegs. And uh, FEMA guy says, uh, could they act like a stirrup to help you, your young passenger, mount the bike? Yeah, that makes uh, so that the, we were talking about the little uh, winglets that uh, we were thinking, hey, maybe this is a design aesthetic. But I guess it would probably be strong enough to, uh, you know, maybe even for the, the main rider to hop over like a stirrup. What do you think? Yeah, that, that's interesting. Um, that could very well be what it is. I know when I take my uh, nieces and nephews on cargo bikes, like the hardest part is getting in and out. Like lots of times I'll just pick them up and put them on there because it's tricky to, to climb, especially when you have that like cage thing there. Or, you know, it's probably a better name than, than kid cage, but whatever it is, um, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to, to get in and out. So that very well may be what that is, like a step for them to get up easier. Yeah, and I just noticed that super long uh, belt drive is goes through there as well so that's interesting keep maybe it's, it helps keep your feet off the belt as well yeah yeah that is it's almost like a design feature the way it's the contrasting color there and that is a super long belt yeah all right that's it for the comments awesome well thank you guys for tuning in uh, and we'll be back in another two weeks for another episode of the wheelie podcast